Welcome back. You're watching In the Market here on AM Live. And of course, we continue the conversation at PES. Uh, this is what we're looking at, of course, this morning, the state of economy. Broadly, what is happening in uh, the economy, the security exchange, the banking sector, or also when it comes to export and imports as well. And just check, checking also the general overview of what is happening elsewhere in the world as well as far as the state of economy is concerned. We are holding court this morning with Peter B. Watt, who is the CEO of Export Promotion Council. We have also Dr. Collins Odote, who is a lecturer at the University of Nairobi, and also he is a columnist with the Business Daily and also an advocate of the High Court. Also, we have the CEO of the Nairobi Security Exchange. This is Geoffrey Odundo. We have also the CEO of Kenya Bankers Association, Habil Olaka, who is here with us this morning. We promise to circle back and see also what, how the Nairobi Security Exchange is faring on so far. And we just want to hear from you, uh, Geoffrey, uh, what is really happening? Why the sharp decline? Uh, is it, how is it related to the dollar? Maybe you can give us a broader overview of what is happening on that front. Okay, thank you, uh, So 2018 has been a very uh, interesting year for us. Uh, we enjoyed a, a very strong beginning. Uh, the first three months of the year, we were recording an average trading volume of about $10 million a day. Uh, this has declined sharply in the beginning of the second half uh, to about $2 million, mm -hmm. two to $3 million a day uh, in the recent past. Uh, but the real attribute of this, um, today the exchange has over 70% of foreign trading on average. Mm -hmm. And what's happening globally is impacting directly on us. Um, the increasing global trade tensions between the U.S. and China, uh, the issues around Brexit, um, the um, strengthening of the U.S. economy, mm -hmm. especially in the stock market, has seen uh, a softening of investments uh, or a softening of investment in emerging markets. Um, and also the risks that uh, face certain key emerging market players like Turkey and Argentina yes. have just generally led to a total um, um, sort of uh, decline in flows coming from those markets into emerging and um, emerging frontier market economies. So uh, that's been largely the fact that uh, there's been a, an attrition of uh, foreign investor activity, more so not exit. I think I'd like to clarify that. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to say exit, then we should be seeing actual turnovers showing huge turnovers of money leaving because you still have to sell the shares mm -hmm. to, to, a treat, to retreat. But I think in what people have done is sort of sort of slow down their trading, holding their positions uh, as they look at how to manage the larger risks. Uh, to your question about the economy, uh, especially around the, the shilling uh, and, and, the, and its concerns, I must say that uh, investors are very happy with the macros of, of the country. They're very happy with uh, the stability of our shilling and the fact that it's predictable because that becomes a very major challenge when you want to invest, when you're not sure about how the shilling will hold yes. in, the, in the near term. And the fact that our shilling has been fairly within target range provides some level of confidence that actually they can be able to, to, to make investments and be able to exit within without huge forex exposures. And it is not just a fact that the shilling is holding, but it's also supported by fundamentals. I think if you look at our forex cover, it's still around 5.6 times um, uh, months in terms of cover. And all these parameters around how the economy is growing, our, our improved um, import, Im exports are increasing. So there are fundamentals that support the, the shilling and which then gives a very, uh, uh, a very, a very um, uh, convincing uh, perception to the investors that Kenya is, co Kenya is a strong economy. Now, our, the importance about the market is that there is a balance which you need to, uh, you need to do. When there's an attrition from foreigners, then the domestic front has got to be stronger. But what we've seen also is that dom domestic investors have also been very shy of the market in a way. Uh, most of them are, are actually putting their money in government treasuries, which they consider more stable. And I attribute that to uh, the challenge that fund managers face in providing returns in the short term. Mm -hmm. I think investors, uh, or, or especially pension funds, need to give fund managers flexibility to, to, to make return reports in probably semi-annually to allow them time to invest and be able to get adequate returns from all asset classes, including the stock market. But when there's a short-term return that you need to make, you'll only look for those markets that are giving you those immediate short-term returns. And that has to change for us to be able to balance uh, the foreign and local investment uh, uh, profile on the market. Because we do have a deep local, local institutional pool. Pension funds control almost one trillion shillings today. 
but just about less than 30% of that is in the stock market. Mm -hmm. If we had more, then we could, we could actually balance uh, these exits from the foreigners. But uh, also the, 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 the reports that we've had dismal performance when it comes to listing companies on the Nairobi Security Exchange. For the last 10 good years, we've had, uh, I think, less than five if you could say, uh, companies listing are on uh, NEC, what could be also informing this as well? Why is there a bath or people are really gun shy uh, to actually list uh, on the NEC right now? Um, there are many, what we've, we've really sat down to really um, try and uh, re-strategize that approach because uptake has been a challenge, quite rightly put. Uh, um, we, have, we, are, we are a very attractive economy on many fronts. I mean, if you look at the growing sectors in Kenya, uh, a lot of money, especially coming through um, PE funds and all these other venture capital funds are targeting the same sectors that we are targeting. Yes. Uh, telecom, technology, um, uh, infrastructure, etc. Now, the, the, the issue around listings has been largely attributable to the fact that um, it's still a bit of more uh, anxiety from, from issuers to come to the market because of lack of a clear uh, understanding of the benefits, which we've been trying to do a lot to educate. Uh, we've been heavily, uh, we haven't had a big government listing in the last, uh, uh, since uh, uh, Safaricom IPO, which was largely the largest listing in this region, and that catalyzes the market and encourages private sector to come. So I'd like to say that there's been a lot of uh, factors that have been very external to, to what we can do to convince uh, issues to come. But what are we doing to change that approach? We are, wa we are working towards increasing uptake by creating a new platform we're calling the Incubator Board, where companies will basically be able to be hosted on the exchange without necessarily uh, having to comply with the regulations of the Capital Markets Authority because they'll not be listed companies. Now, while you're hosted, you then get an experiential, um, uh, experiential feeling of the market in that you start feeling like a listed company and also interacting with various investment and advisors towards creating or preparing you for uh, a possible listing or raising capital on the market with a clear understanding that you're already, a, you're already in the market in, in, in some form. And that sort of just sort of de de delivers or, or sort of insulates the, issue, the anxiety that you have. So we are working on that and we are also engaging with government to see how we can bring in more listings from the government sector and, and a lot of good conversations are going on. Uh, this year we do expect to see a cross listing, uh, which we think will also be large and will be able to create or sort of restart or, or, or sort of plug mm -hmm. that, uh, uh, that negative run we've been having. So there's a lot of activity around that and we do believe that the market is attractive enough for issues to come in. Right. Uh, let's say from Collins the daughter, I don't know what you're reading so far as far as uh, uh, what our CEO is saying this morning, uh, of course, also the glacial slowness the up, on the uptake. Uh, what would be your reading? I think about the performance of the Nairobi Stock Exchange is invariably also a barometer of the performance of the economy. And the last time that the stock exchange was extremely robust mm -hmm. was in the run up to the 2007 elections. I think we had the highest number of new Kenyans yes. joining the stock exchange. Before then, it was for old people, people who are extremely wealthy, but in the run-up to 2007, a lot of people got it. I think after that, for the last 10 years, the economy has been going through shocks and bumps. Mm -hmm. And that's also reflected in the performance of the stock exchange, especially for domestic uh, investors. You know people have money, that for the bulk of them, they consider almost wasted. People who, for example, invested in Mumia's sugar uh, shares, uh, which reduced heavily. People who invested in Kenya Airways. And I think uh, because of that, there is less and less interest of ordinary Kenyans putting their money in the stock exchange. And I think that's something that uh, requires to be dealt with. Because unless we have confidence in the stock exchange based on performance, there's going to be a lot of people not being interested in going to the stock exchange. I think the related issue to that, if you look at the bad performance of some of, some of the listed companies, it isn't because of the stock exchange. It is also because of governance issues. If you look at the challenges around Mumias, for example, if you look at the challenges around Kenya, so it therefore means that there's a link between how the stock exchange performs and how the larger economy and issues around corruption are dealt with. And I think that's something that we need to fix as a country because unless we do so, then we'll continue having the challenges. My last issue 
is uh, and there's something that uh, Geoffrey needs to do much more uh, he just spoke about the flexibility that's required but I think there's also need for greater engagement with Kenya so that people realize that investment in the stock exchange is not uh, short term it is not money that you make in a month because that's what people did in 2007 we were running and saying if I put in my money in a month I will get 20% return, and we did. Uh, but now when you start not getting it, you're like, no, this is not what I want. I want to go to 90 days treasury bills. I want to go to something. We must, all, we must have a much more longer term focus in our investment decision because that's the only way the country and the economy will grow. And that's how we'll be able to support the stock exchange. Maybe we can hear also from Biwot uh, uh, to tell us more because I think Kenyans also have this uh, obsession with, uh, you know, tangible assets like land you know uh, you, they want uh, houses they want you know uh, real estate but when it comes to intangible assets like you know a stock exchange and buying shares as well i think do you think also maybe the nsc has done a, a, a good job or a bad job in terms of educating the public of yes truly it doesn't really have to be land because the map of kenya is not really expanding Right, and the, the population is, is growing exponentially. So what will happen 50 years from now when we have scarce resources like land? I think NSC and the shares should be the place where the most Kenyans will invest. Do you think also uh, maybe in terms of uh, broadening, broadening their citizens' understanding on what really happens at the NSC should be uh, taken on a wider scale? Yes, I think that is the issue. I think um, uh, what the, the CEO has said is in, the, issue, the question of information. If, if we can be able to reach out to many Kenyans on the question of diversification of the economy so that we don't focus, because really even when you look at what Kenyans are doing currently, they are, they are investing a lot of their, their money in uh, you know, real estate because of that quick money. So we, we need to um, enhance uh, capacity building and sensitizations of Kenyans to realize that any savings you make, because the, savings, the, the question of savings in the country is still, is still quite low. So what we need to do is to reach out to you know, the, the various sectors of the economy which are not well represented in the stock exchange so that Kenyans can take interest in putting their money in shares. So I think that's one of the, the, the biggest questions that uh, all of us uh, uh, should contribute to. Mm -hmm. The question of information asymmetry. And I think if the NSC can come out and hold forums and reach out to many Kenyans for, for all of us to understand, especially the middle class, you know, those guys who have a lot of savings, mm -hmm. then this question can actually be able to be addressed. In terms of the economy, I think the economy has been resilient. Um, uh, in the last quarter, we saw that the economy actually grew by about 6.3 percent. Yes. Uh, but still, it is a f there, are, there are a few sectors contributing to the economy. So if we can be able to, you know, um, uh, ensure that majority of the sectors, and I know now we are focusing on the manufacturing, like for some manufacturers, there are some of our leading local investors. Can we be able to reach out to them so that they can be able to, you know, put some of their savings uh, to the stock exchange? Mm -hmm. So maybe this is something that we need to do. All right. So you and dropping also the uh, SMEs as well. Uh, how has been the uptake? Because also we know within the five good years uh, that we've, I think for the last five good years, we've seen also almost two, almost two million actually SMEs closing shop because of unfavorable, conducive, uh, you know, working or business environment as well. I don't know how this has adversely affected the NSE as well. Yeah. I, think, but I want to just also just uh, <coughs> provide further insights on the, on the two points that have been raised. I think one, the exchange is truly the reflective of, the, of, the, of the what's happening in the economy because we cover all the real sectors. All the, com all the sectors of the economy are actually, uh, have companies listed on the exchange. And so depending on how the sectors perform, then you'd have a direct measure of how those companies will perform. If it's construction, if there's a construction boom, there's a definitely a good performance of our cement companies. If there's a manufacturing boom, then you have a clear, a clear uh, correlation to the market. Uh, so we've been seeing that, uh, and so one, it's true that uh, it's, it's really a reflection of that economy. However, um, I think the investment philosophy of, of the Kenyan, we needs to change. I mean, the investment philosophy, the investment thesis that we have, we've been pre we've been predominantly real estate focused. Yes, but you're also seeing there's actually for the first time a decline in the in the in the prices or in the valuation of real estate in Kenya, mm -hmm. especially the high end. Uh, there's been a very huge supply of, um, of of rental space in the high end, especially residential, that is actually empty today, and people are uh, are actually uh, losing out or making losses. Mm -hmm. However, there are solutions available on the market on how to own property in Kenya. 
You can actually use the real invest estate investment trust, for instance, a product where you don't necessarily have to own physical property. You can own a unit of, of, of a stock in a property portfolio. Mm -hmm. uh, we have other products that, are, that, for instance, today if you wanted to own commodities like gold, you can actually use the market as well to own an ETF. So it's a lot around the education. It's a lot around changing the overall philosophy. We are looking at how can we cascade the uh, educational content right from high school straight to the university and also to the, to the so that this new generation coming into the market clearly understands that you don't no longer have to hold physical assets and hold intangible assets. Mm -hmm. And that's the approach globally. And so we're working on how we can cascade that education content downstream. We're also working how can we then also make sure that we cut that uh, upstream to, to, to even uh, the current donors. And even if you have real estate today, you can convert it into shares and be able to, to have them and offer them to the public and be able to have a liquid asset. Because today, even if you had property and you want to realize it, when there's no clear, de clear sub, um, uh, demand for it physically, you can actually trade off the market. So there's a big um, focus around content, around access, around new, uh, new products, and around uh, increasing uptake, and we're working on all that. And I take this very, very, uh, these reviews very, very positively that we need to do more. We need to do more uh, with our partners in the industry to provide more education and more understanding on the value that you have in the market. Because it's been proven over five years, the stock market asset mm -hmm. class mm -hmm. really outperforms any that you have in the any other asset class in the, in the economy. All right, thank yeah. you. Uh, unless, uh, Hab Habilalaki, you want to chime in also on this uh, before we move on now to see also on the profitability? I think, and yeah, how I think the only resilient. thing, um, I mean, I totally agree with, um, with what has been um, uh, mentioned. The, the only thing I was going to more or less like emphasize is the awareness creation. Because mm -hmm. you recall in 2007, yes. uh, when we, I would say when we had almost like a boom, and a number of people were investing without really knowing the mechanics. So you'll get somebody going to a bank to get a loan, to buy shares, and expecting to repay the loan from the proceeds of, of you know, the return mm, the from return, the investment. Yeah. Mm. This is a long-term investment. This one is because the bank loan has got a determined repayment per month. You're not going to be able to get that kind of return from the investment in the shares to repay your bank loan. But I think a number of people are not aware. So the moment you invest, for example, and the share value tanks, meanwhile you have got an obligation that is permanent and is, um, is, 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 is not moving down, you have got a mismatch. And I think people, a number of people may have found themselves in a almost stuck. Now, if there had been awareness creation, mm -hmm. to the point whereby the person knows that um, uh, uh, you cannot borrow on fixed debt, to finance an investment in, uh, in, you know, in, in shares, mm -hmm. I think that, that will be critical and that will boost the uptick of the shares because then people go into the investment knowing the, you know, the, the, the repercussions. Right. Yeah. And, and, and you mentioned also uh, the U.S., China, of course, uh, trade tiff that is go ongoing and is adversely affecting also uh, uh, the dollar. It's adversely affecting us as well. Uh, I don't know what sort of um, mitigation, or maybe from your own perception, or uh, I don't know you can tell us, what mitigation do they need to take care? Because we've had uh, this morning, we just ran a clip, we ran a clip of uh, Donald Trump saying that, yes, we're going to also reimpose uh, more sanctions on China. So what does it portend as well? Uh, already we're in a dire or a slippery slope as far as that is concerned. Do we have any uh, mitigation plan as far as these externality shocks are concerned? I don't know, or yeah, uh, maybe even from the banking sectors. I don't know how also that has adversely affected you as well. Any of you oh, can actually okay. pick up, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, yes. I think, first of all, um, <clears throat> the escalating trade tensions, uh, trade tensions between China and the U.S. Um, definitely has a co has an impact on the stock market mm -hmm. most to speak because of the foreign investor activity there will be a more uh, there will be probably more uh, attrition towards uh, more developed markets because we want to play safe um, having said that i think we as 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 a, as a country we are not a, we are not we are actually looking at how can we broaden the investment profile because that's one mitigation how can you broaden your investment profile internationally, for instance. Um, how can you get more uh, flows coming from these regions, like sort of diversifying mm -hmm. our investment uh, pools of capital, it be they from the developed markets, Asia, which for a long time has got a very low um, 
investment in, in, in Africa? How can we attract more of those companies or, or more of those investors playing a role in our capital markets? It's more around diversifying that investment pool. But again, also strengthening our local uh, investment pool. I think one of the things that has helped Kenya, and you can remember in 2008, in the global financial crisis, we did not experience uh, the, the real shocks of what happened globally in, in a very significant way. One, because we do not have a very heavy, uh, we had a very strong domestic front, we had a most diverse economy, we had a, a, a large investment pool of domestic money, which was helping the market strengthen. We had, um, uh, I would say, a stronger uh, economic framework, and hence we didn't feel the real, real shock of what happened in the global financial crisis. Mm -hmm. so it was definitely an attrition by foreigners, yes. but this was rebalanced by uh, a long, uh, local investor participation. I think we, it's just around how do we manage our economy, how do we make sure that we have a good mix of domestic capital and foreign capital so that we do not overly uh, rely on foreign capital. So there are measures that we can be able to do to, to mitigate that. Right, and uh, yeah, yeah, let's hear from BB what? Uh, from yes, I can actually say, um, the trade wars between China and the U.S. can actually be looked at as an opportunity to the country um, in the sense that in the wake of Brexit and nationalization of leading economies, which are actually the advocates of the market economy, Kenya has looked into diversifying our markets. As you are all are aware, Kenya was the first country to ratify the African continental free trade area. So while those countries sought each other, as a country, I think we need to look into how we can be able to expand our trade, our exports to the African continent, and, they in, and by ensuring that if we can be able to ensure that um, 22 countries actually ratify in the continent, and the continent becomes a free trade area, then investors in the U.S., investors in China, who already have strong interest in Kenya, yes. can actually set base. Mm -hmm. And I think looking at trade as one contributor, because as we speak today, the flow of foreign exchange to the country especially from export of goods and services, has not been, you know, at the level that we expect. Yes. Um, so if we can be able to diversify markets as well as products, it will be able to solve uh, some of the challenges we see at the national, uh, at the stock exchange, mm -hmm. and also broadly at the economy. But even when we talk about the African free continental uh, uh, trade area so far, we saw only how many countries had ratified out of the 35? There are about, um, oh, oh. There are about nine. About nine. I think so what is happening with the 35? All of them are actually at that conference, it's measly nine. I think the last time we checked it was two. I think Kenya and Malawi. No, no, Zambi uh, Kenya, Kenya and Ghana. Kenya and Ghana. I think what is happening, we, we as a country, we, we are playing a leading role in terms of convincing, you know, the other African countries. What actually should be clear is that about 45, uh, 44 countries, uh, 54 countries are actually uh, 44 uh, countries actually signed. Mm -hmm. So the, ratif the ratification process is what is going on. And in December, all African states are converging in, in Cairo. And Kenya is playing a leading role in terms of convincing because what Africa needs to know is that if we can open the continent to trade, actually we will be able to absorb, absorb the shocks that comes as a result of Brexit and other you know, uh, uh, trade wars which are happening uh, worldwide. Mm -hmm. So it's actually a reality. It will not happen immediately, but it is going to happen within the next year and uh, within the next one and a half years. Right. And in terms of the objectives of the continent in realization of the African economic community, I think we are actually on course. In fact, uh, it is 2018-2019, which is expected that all African countries will actually be able to sign and ratify uh, the African continental free trade area. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, the, the tough wars between the U.S. and China uh, should actually not be seen as a disadvantage. Uh, while the U.S. says we will impose sanctions on China, they couch it as if China is doing some negative things to the entire world, and that they are imposing of sanctions is to the benefit of the rest of us. It isn't. Uh, I think for me, each of them is pushing for economic dominance and pushing their interests, which is a, a legitimate thing. Mm -hmm. I think the bigger problem is the, the conversations remind you of the scramble for Africa. Yes. Uh, where the people who are pushing the agenda are clear about what we want. And those of us who are on the receiving end are hoping for a miracle. Uh, we don't ask ourselves, so what is our strategy and how do we align that strategy? And that's the, big, that's the big, uh, 
the challenge. When the West were giving us resources, at least in a big percentage, their greatest strategy was that they would give you, they would accompany it with some development assistance, and they would be giving you human rights conditionalities so that you push government. The Chinese have said, no, 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 we want a different strategy. We will just focus on economics. We will give you loans, we will give you cheap cheap loans, we will come and even help you implement. Then before you realize you are in huge debt. I remember making the case 10 years ago when China was becoming a big issue that, you know, from an exploitation perspective, if you go to my grandmother in the village, it does not matter whether it is the Chinese or the Americans exploiting them. At the end of the day, it's being exploited. What's much more important, what then is our response strategy? How do we take advantage of this process? And I think that's where the greatest conversation is. And it boils down to a little bit of what the water said, that as we look at even how we trade with our neighbors, yes. how do we deepen that relationship? If you go to the EAC, for example, mm -hmm. you'll find that uh, sometimes the relationship between the EAC countries is less strong as it should be. Uh, uh, Tanzania and Kenya will be worrying much more about how they put obstacles onto each other's way. We have a common market protocol, but we still don't want to have free movement of persons. Yet we are allowing China to come in freely. Mm -hmm. We can't be able to deal with the economic implications of a globalizing world when we don't put our agenda much more at the forefront and when we don't strengthen our regional integration arrangements. Thank you.